Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started with lecture. Um, today's lecture is going to be covering chapter 11, which is dealing with uh, microbial control, basically. So we're talking about cleaning things, keeping things sterile and all of that. Chapter 12, we'll be dealing with antibiotics. It gets its whole chapter, its whole own chapter. Um, so we'll be getting to that one next. Um, before we get started, uh, I know I saw already some of you for lab, but those of you who haven't gone to lab yet, let, yet Yes, we are having um, lab uh, review today. So just FYI, that will be following this um, for those of you who have my late lab. Um, and you don't need your lab coat for that. That's fine. It'll be hot in there. You guys already know that, though. Actually, you know what? We'll just do it in here. How does that sound? Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cooler. We're already in here. <laughs> yeah, we'll just do it in here. You guys get that lucky, lucky uh, you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, 
did already post the Kahoot video, a recording of it, as well as the Kahoot itself, which you guys are welcome to use however you see fit. Um, but, but it is the same Kahoot that we'll be doing for our review, just so that you guys know. Um, it is optional, of course, to attend with the review. So if you guys do decide you don't want to attend the review, you're welcome to leave. I'm not going to keep you here. But um, yeah, but I you know, love it if you'd stay. Um, I don't know if I told you guys, I think I already did, but I am going to be studying, studying, starting a like study group thing, probably um, for those of you who want to work on study habits or study, you know, I don't know, working on your study stuff. Now, if you think you're not very good at studying, maybe all you do is, you know, flashcards and it doesn't seem like it's working out for you or going over your notes and it doesn't seem like it's working out for you, or you just want to learn some new techniques um, or get in the habit of, you know, putting um, some effort into studying uh, in a different way. That's what it's basically going to be. I'm thinking maybe once a week. I'm probably going to do it over Zoom eventually, but the first day we're going to do it is going to be when we go over the um, unknown report because like that's going to take all five minutes, and then we can just go straight into um, doing that. If so, of course, if you don't want to learn about that, you can leave at that point. But that one will be an in-person going over some study um, stuff to help you guys maybe focus a little more so you don't waste as much time. I feel like that's a big part of it too, is that people don't want to study because it takes so much time. But most of the time, people are wasting their time with their, their efforts. So I want to try to help you guys out a little bit with that. If you don't, if you like it, stick around. If you don't, don't. So anyways, um, well, we're going to get right into uh, chapter 11. Let's do it. This is not a very exciting chapter. I'm just going to warn you guys. Okay, um, starting out, there's some terms that are gonna be dealing, we are going to be dealing with that you guys need to be familiar with, for sure gonna be testing you guys on these terms and knowing the differences between them. Sterilizing, sterilization, this is the destruction of all microbial life. So here we're talking about even the endospores. They're super hardy, but they ain't gonna survive sterilization, all right? Next we have disinfection. Disinfection is basically, um, we have two forms. If we take sterilization, if we don't achieve sterilization for any reason, we're not killing the endospores or just not everything's getting killed, whatever it is. And then our next steps down, if we're talking about inanimate surfaces, disinfection, okay? If we're talking about animate surfaces, antisepsis. We also call it degermination. Degermination. I always call it antisepsis, so I'm not ever gonna call it anything else. Um, so the, the, neither of these are going to be achieving sterilization or sterile con conditions, okay? Um, but they are going to remove most microbial life, just not all of it. And then we have decontamination, which is its own thing. Decontamination is either animate or inanimate surfaces, mechanical removal. So here we're talking about scrubbing and things like that, okay? Or it could even be um, filtering, that's mechanical removal. This is a great chart. I highly, highly encourage you guys to become familiar with it. And not only just with this chart itself, but with the things that I have listed in your um, study sheet, being able to apply them into whatever area they might fall into, right? And um, being able to answer why they fall into that area or not. So we do have things like incineration and dry oven, um, steam under pressure, which is autoclave, boiling water, hot water pasteurization, that's not gonna sterilize and all that sort of stuff, which we're gonna be, don't worry, going through every single one of these. Um, but yeah, and great also with this, this char chart, the thing that I like the most probably about this chart is gonna be this is here with it. You have your definitions of like what disinfection and of sterilization and everything is so that you can know, and it's color coded on there. So you know like what you're actually talking about as opposed to just, yes, these are words on a chart. So hopefully, um, you guys get use out of that because I think it's a great way to organize kind of your uh, understanding of what we're going over today. So talking about things that are very, very resistant versus um, the not ones that aren't so resistant. Well, let's put it into perspective, shall we? Um, we have prions at the very top. I'm going to come back to those. I'm not going to do those right this second. Uh, we'll start out with the ones that we can definitely say are living, basically. The bacterial endospores, okay? They are dormant, but they are still considered living creatures. Um, and then we have the mycobacterium. These have the waxy coating. These are acid fast, right? So they're pretty hardy because that waxy coating. 
All right, then we have staphylococcus and just a whole bunch of crap after that, right? I do want to point something out. Down here at the very bottom, the um, least resistant or most susceptible, right, uh, to these cleaning agents is going to be the enveloped viruses. So we have a virus that's stolen, the lipid, you know, membrane, lipid bilayer from its host by budding through it. Um, these guys are pretty susceptible to cleaning agents, at least on the scale of comparison, comparison like we have up here. Um, so here we are talking about COVID. So that's what that SARS-CoV-2 is. COVID-19 falls into this category, as does the flu and a whole bunch of other viruses that we know of. So we know how hardy those can be. Probably, you know, if, even if I were, had told you before, oh, I sneezed all over this earlier. Um, you know, you might want to, want to touch it. It's got COVID on it now. That you believe there'd be COVID there because there very easily could be because they're not, you know, um, super wimpy but they're the wimpiest ones on the list. So that really puts, I feel like, puts uh, the endospores into perspective here because, you know, it's hard to get rid of COVID. Talk about them endospores, y'all. So prions are completely different because they are just proteins and they're misfolded proteins at that. The normal protein isn't shaped or folded that way. So in a way, these are already denatured. So how do you get rid of something that isn't folded up properly anyway? Um, it's not alive. You don't kill it or anything like that. You have to use extremely high heat, so much higher heat than you normally would use. And you often have to introduce stuff like uh, a very strong basic uh, compounds like sodium hydroxide solution and stuff like that. Um, so if you work in a hospital and you end up working in an ER or you end up working on a floor that deals with neurological conditions, you may encounter um, somebody who could potentially have one of those prion diseases, usually CJD, um, and you may be doing testing to just like eliminate those concerns and not just like traditional, you know, normal um, dementia or something like that. Uh, you almost never see anybody test positive for that in their like um, CSF, but you know, you can technically test for that. And so we would get samples for that uh, up there and we'd have to just like, everything had to be like extra covered with like these uh, diaper, I call them the diaper pads. I don't know what they look like. <laughs> puppy pee pads, but it's on everything to, just to cover everything so you can just throw it away and put it in biohazard so that you don't have to worry about if there's any prions on it. We would double glove so that um, it was extra, you know, cautious there as well. But yes, they're very, very difficult to get rid of. Okay, moving on. Endospores. They're considered the most resistant of the microbial entities, right? These are living. So as far as the living ones go, most resistant are the endospores. Um, that's the whole goal of sterilization is to get rid of endospores, anything less than that. And you're not cheating any sterilization there. You need to be getting rid of everything in order to get there. Um, disinfection and asepsis, sorry, asepsis or antisepsis, either way you want to call it. Um, these are less uh, effective. And so they may not get rid of all of the endospores. Sterilization means um, removing all viable microorganisms that could even be viable. And um, going through the process, then you would be considered sterile after that. Um, so we want to consider uh, this first uh, surgical instruments, syringes, and certain packaged foods might be exposed to this as well. Um, so moving on to disinfection, this is, of course, going to be mostly inanimate objects, and it's not going to be achieving sterilization. So we're not removing the endospores. It's typically the line that we draw everything, okay? Um, decontamination, mechanical removal. Um, this could be scrubbing, this could be filtration. Uh, then we have antisepsis. So there's all these terms associated with just this concept, okay? Sepsis, we know if you are septic, you are having bacteria grow in your bloodstream, right? So that says right there, sepsis, growth of microorganisms in blood or tissues where they shouldn't be. Asepsis, we know asepsis because we know aseptic technique. But asepsis is anything that prevents entry of infectious agents into sterile tissues. In aseptic techniques, especially when we're talking about in medicine, these are supposed to be sterile methods that exclude all microbes. Now, I want to point that out because this is going to be something related to what we do on our test when we talk about aseptic technique in the lab. We're talking about getting rid of all microbes, like preventing contamination with all microbes. We are not concerned with only pathogens, right? In the lab, we're concerned about contamination with any microbes at all. So remember that, that is a that is a difference, okay? Um, anyways, moving on to antisepsis, uh, this, and using antiseptics, anything on a, a, 
animate surface, so living tissue, um, to remove microbes. Cidal agents are anything that's going to be killing. I don't think you guys need me to go through these, right? Bactericidal, fungicidal, viricidal. The only one that might be new to us in concept would be sporicidal. These are the ones that are going to be killing endospores. So typically, if we're achieving that, we're achieving killing everything, pretty much, um, typically. So we also have germicide. Oh, geez, why? Germicide and microbicide. So just germs or microbes, right? That is what that's talking about. So very general use agents there. Okay. The static agents, uh, microbostatic, bacteriostatic, whatever it is. Here we're just inhibiting growth or preventing multiplication of the microbes. All right. Next we have uh, concerns in microbial control. You're trying to keep things clean. What should you be considering? Um, do you need to sterilize the thing or is disinfection adequate? Um, do we need to destroy the endospores? or can it just be vegetative pathogens in whatever you're working on? Um, is the item to be reused or are we gonna permanently discard it after this one use? Um, if it will be reused, can the item withstand heat, pressure, radiation, or chemicals? Those are normal ways that we would be trying to sterilize things. Uh, is the control method suitable for a given application? Uh, you can't autoclave a patient's bed, right? So, so autoclaving may not be uh, usable for every single thing that you could think of. Um, and you may not want to spray down an entire room with like a hand bottle spray, for example, just stuff like that. It, it, that's what it's talking about. And will the agent penetrate to the necessary extent? Um, here we're talking about if you need to get through surfaces and penetrate whole like tissue and everything like that, um, you might want to consider something that actually can penetrate as opposed to like if you look at UV radiation, it only gets to the surface of something. So we'll get into that in a moment. But um, is the method cost and labor efficient? And is it safe? Of course, because we don't want to be exposing ourselves or our patients to any of this stuff if it is, um, you know, going to hurt them or us. What is happening? Okay, that brings us to this concept of uh, how we can divide things up based on how critical or, or useful they are in medicine. Um, this just means that we can look at things and say, this doesn't need to be sterilized completely, or this does, or whatever it is. We can divide it up um, based on our needs, on our use. So critical medical devices, they're going to come into contact with sterile tissues. Here we're talking about surgical instruments typically, right? Um, Semi-critical medical devices come into contact with mucosal membranes. This includes things like thermometers or respiratory equipment, right? Um, Non-critical medical devices, these are things that don't touch the patient or they only touch the patient's intact skin. So here we're talking about electrodes and, um, you know, uh, leads that would be clipping onto the electrodes, uh, surfaces that the patient might be touching or that you might be touching as a healthcare professional, all of that non-critical. Okay, um, we have to consider a lot of things as well whenever we're trying to pick an agent, uh, the number of microorganisms in whatever you're trying to clean. Uh, the nature of the microbes in the population, are they going to be more resistant or less resistant to whatever you're using? The type of microbial growth, um, bacteria, fungal, viral, that sort of stuff. Temperature and pH of the environment, uh, some agents might be sensitive to that. The con concentration of the agent, uh, do you need it super concentrated or can you use it less concentrated? Mode of action of the agent, does it affect uh, certain aspects of the cell um, and does that matter to you? Presence of solvents. Um, interfering organic matter and inhibitors, whether that's going to in, uh, inhibit the ability of the cleanliness ability, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say, the effectiveness is what I'm trying to say, of the thing that you're choosing to clean with, okay? All right, how do they work? These micro antimicrobial agents, we can talk about the physical and the chemical, they both cover the same four, okay? They can affect the cell wall, the uh, cell or cytoplasmic membrane, the cellular synthetic processes, which it means what it's talking about here is going to be DNA and RNA, so the nucleic acids, so the production of them or can even degrade them, um, cause damage to them, and then affecting proteins. A lot of times that refers to, in this case with the chemicals, we're mostly talking about denaturing proteins. Okay? We're talking about uh, microbial control mechanisms like this, cleaning and, and sterilizing and that. We're mostly talking about uh, that sort of stuff like denaturing proteins as opposed to the reason I'm bringing this up 
when we get into antibiotics in the next chapter, we're not going to be referring to um, denaturation of the proteins so much as we're going to be talking about uh, preventing them from being made. So controlling the ribosomes, okay? So that's why I bring it up. There are differences here that are quite significant whenever you compare microbial control versus antibiotics, okay? Um, all right, so if we're affecting the cell wall, we can uh, affect uh, the cell wall synthesis. We could digest the cell wall itself. We could break it down or even just the surface of the cell wall. And when we do that, it makes the cells more susceptible to being lysed. This includes detergents and alcohols. They fall into this category, okay? Um, next, the cell membrane. Uh, so remember, our membrane is comprised of our lipids and also protein channels typically in the membrane. So we can disrupt the whole membrane and that will lead to loss of selective permeability. So that had to deal with only water could get across and the other things couldn't. We can disrupt that and make it so that things can get in and out. However, loss of vital molecules can then result. And then we can allow the entry of damaging chemicals as well. Um, whenever we pop, we start making holes basically in the surface of the cell. So this starts out with surfactants. These are polar molecules that go figure. Okay, they're amphipathic. This should be a familiar term to you guys. What molecule did we know and already learn about that was amphipathic? The phospholipid, right? So they had that charged head and the um, hydrophobic tail, right? And that made up our lipid bilayer. This, these guys mimic that in a way, okay? So they have a charged head and they have a hydrophobic tail um, that allows them to sort of uh, sneak in between the uh, parts of the lipid bilayer and then cause the stuff to leak out of the cell. So here's how it works. You have the actual lipid bilayer normal situation over here. These guys mimic it, at least in far, as far as structure goes. It might have a different charge and stuff like that, but um, they'll stick in there and then eventually cause a weakness in the membrane that can let things get in or out or both. Okay, so that's how that would work with the cell membrane. All right, so that's surfactants and detergents fall into that category. Um, you guys ever heard about the generation of my cells in chemistry? I don't know if you guys ever talked about my cell, but it's basically, um, you know, you have something like a phospholipid coming together and creating, uh, hiding its little tails away, but its heads are like on the outside, they're charged um, to create, you know, a happy environment on the inside and the outside's interacting with the water and we're all good and happy. Um, the surfactants and the detergents can do that and even. and um, cause that to happen with parts of the membrane as well. So like rip it apart and incorporate it into my cells. So that can be quite uh, damaging to cell membranes. Okay, three and four, here we're talking about nucleic acid and protein synthesis. Um, we can inhibit ribosomes. That will also inhibit protein synthesis, but we're mostly gonna be talking about denaturation. I'm just being honest here. Um, nucleic acids are necessary for you know, microbes to make proteins that help drive their whole processes that they can't replicate at all if they can't do this. So nucleic acids, we're usually going to interfere with um, transcription or DNA replication, of some kind. Um, and then we can even alter the DNA code with some of these. Okay. Um, native state of a protein, we, we kind of already understand a little bit about denaturation because we've learned about DNA, right? When you denature DNA, you're splitting apart the uh, hydrogen bonds to that hold the two strands together, right? Same thing with proteins. You denature a protein, you're ripping apart those hydrogen bonds that maintain the structure of the protein. You can get it even all the way straightened out, completely denatured. So then it can't function, it can't do its function anymore. And that's what the importance is of denaturation. A lot of times that change will be permanent. Okay. So the natural state is the one that normally functions. So we can denature proteins using moist heat. An example of this, the irreversible solidification of egg whites when you boil eggs. So you cannot go back to the original egg if you boil that egg, right? So it's completely different um, in its form. And that's thanks to denaturing the proteins um, from that moist heat causing that change. We can also use strong organic solvents like alcohols and acids and phenolics that can cause a similar effect, um, as well as metallic ions that can bind at active sites. So here we have the native state protein on the far left. We can have complete denaturation, which is such complete unfolding of the protein. It is not gonna act on the substrate at that point, right? So that's one way. We can also alter its shape. So it's just a little bit different. Um, 
you know, uh, treating it with a certain pH of a solution and stuff like that can have this sort of effect. Um, so now we can't bind with our substrate and act on it anymore because our shape changed. Another uh, option would be agents that bind the competitive inhibitors, right? They're going to bind at the actual active sites of our uh, protein. It'll stay in the native state, state but these uh, things will interfere with the substrate's ability to interact with that protein. Um, a lot of times it's with the metallic ions. All right. <clears throat> so heat is the most widely used method of microbial control by far, but there are other versions, okay? Radiation, filtration, ultrasonic waves, and um, cold. So these are also physical waves. There's other ones we're gonna talk about too, but I do wanna mention ultrasonic waves because we're not gonna be going over that in this chapter really. I used to uh, volunteer at the Humane Society at their spay and neuter clinic. Well, I did it once. It was really, uh, I don't know, it's upsetting or something. I don't know what to call it, but um, it's great work that they do. Don't get me wrong, but it's just like, they are cranking out, you know, these surgical procedures, like nobody's business. I mean, it's just like dog after dog, after dog, after dog, after dog. And um, while they go through it, they have their surgical instruments. They just drop into these buckets on the floor. And so I would go in there and go grab these uh, buckets that were on the floor. And then I would go and clean the surgical instruments. A lot of times you would uh, clean them in a soapy solution in a machine that you would turn on and it would have ultrasonic waves that would help remove the debris off of the instruments. This is very common in cleaning medical instruments in general, but it just helps remove tissue and stuff like that that got stuck in the, uh, you know, the scissors or whatever it is that you are cleaning. And then you would um, package them up and put them in an autoclave and sterilize them. So uh, that's typically how it would work. But ultrasonic waves are used, um, to, you know, you, you don't hear it necessarily, but it like vibrates the water and you see it working. So I don't know what else to say about it, but it does exist. <laughs> I'm just not gonna go into detail about it. Um, all right, moist heat going on with this. We have concepts of just hot water, then boiling water and steam. Those are our different versions you can deal with. Um, temperatures can range from 60 to 135 degrees Celsius. Now, most sterilization procedures are going to be done at 121 degrees Celsius. Most autoclaves are going to operate at that temperature. Uh, they go up to 135 in the case of prions. That's the temperature you have to go up to for a prion. It's just unusual. You don't usually see it, but you would go up to that if you needed to deal with that. Um, temperature of the steam can be regulated by adjusting pressure in that in a closed container. Okay. So yes, we can have hot water going into it, but the pressure itself allows for that temperature change to occur more effectively, okay? Um, so then we can treat things at a lower temperature and shorter exposure time compared to dry heat, okay? And then uh, most microbicidal effects will be due to coagulation of proteins. It's a misshape, they, they stick together, they can't work that way. And then denaturation of the proteins as well. Um, and that will permanently halt microbial metabolism because we all know you need enzymes in order to do any of that crap, right? All right, heat, um, let's see, dry heat now. This is going to be usually a flame or an electric heating coil. Temperature can range up uh, from 160 degrees Celsius to several thousand degrees Celsius. Um, this will dehydrate the cell and the lack of water can cause this, this stability. Okay, sorry. The lack of water increases stability of some proteins. That's why it's more effective to have the water in the case of the, you know, uh, moist heat. Okay, but um, here we need higher temperatures that will eventually lead to oxidation and reduction, literal oxidation redox reactions that will lead to uh, turning all of the molecules and the whole thing to ash. We've seen it with our bacteria, uh, but this is literally the same thing as when we talk about uh, cremating a body, for example. Um, that high heat is literally oxidizing and reducing molecules um, in the whole body and reducing it to ash. Okay. All right, so uh, this is an example comparing. So if you wanted to treat something with moist heat at 121 degrees Celsius, you'd only need to expose it for 15 minutes. If it was dry heat at the same temperature, 121 degrees Celsius, you would have to expose it for 600 minutes, which is six... Uh, I guess, what would that be? Yeah, six, 10 hours, 10 hours. Yeah, 10 hours, man. That's quite the difference. Put something in an oven for 10 hours. I don't want to, <laughs> sounds awful. Okay, um, heat resistance and thermal death. Um, some you know, things like bacterial endospores and even some vegetative cells are gonna be 
more resistant to heat than others. I mean, that's no surprise. Um, so we might want to try out and see what method will work better for you. Somebody thankfully mostly did all of this for you whenever you go reach, reach for your cleaners and stuff. But um, this is how they got there. So this is, this is doing a test to see the shortest length of time that you have to expose something at a specific temperature in order to kill all the microbes. Okay, So you know the temperature, but you want to know how much time it's going to take to kill everything at that temperature. So that's the thermal death time. The thermal death point. Now you're going to expose something for 10 minutes. Um, you want to kill all the microbes. What's the lowest temperature you can expose it at to achieve that? So you would want to figure this out for certain um, uh, cleaners that you may be working with or uh, physical. Of course, we're dealing with heat. Uh, like the autoclave or even um, like the microbes that you might be exposed to. So these are all concerns that you'd want to use these concepts for the thermal death time and the thermal death point. Okay. Thermal death point, lowest temperature. Thermal death time, shortest time. Okay. Boiling water. Boiling water is great for disinfection. Okay. I want to be clear. We said of disinfection that it is not sterilization. Okay. So you cannot sterilize with boiling water, okay? Um, processing at 100 degrees Celsius in one exposure, which is usually what people would be doing even for 30 minutes, will not kill all resistant cells, uh, but it will kill most non-endospore forming pathogens. But the endospore forming ones can survive this. Um, you can treat things, it'll be fine. Decontaminating um, things that way or disinfecting things that way uh, is a useful practice, but uh, it, you will risk your items becoming recontaminated essentially when it's exposed back to the environment after it cools off, you know, that's a problem. Uh, but it is useful if you want to clean things for your babies, make sure that the, um, the bottles are sterilized and you're not gonna sterilize, like I said, but um, disinfect it as much as possible. You're probably not as concerned about endospores in these sorts of situations is what I'm saying. Um, it says bedding and clothing from the sick room. I'm not sure if we all have a sick room in our house, but last time I checked, I don't. Um, but it, during COVID, of course, most of us may have quarantined into a room, which you call that the sick room, okay? Um, if you wanted to disinfect that uh, clothing and bedding from that area, you could boil it um, to disinfect it. So most of us probably didn't do that, though, on bedding. Um, it's great for uh, boiling, like drinking water. Uh, you can remove endospore from that, as well as removing um, uh, like giardia and stuff like that. But you're not going to have sterilization. All right, another one that doesn't sterilize, pasteurization. You guys know that your milk is pasteurized, yes? Um, and there is like a situation that you have to go through if you want to buy a non-pasteurized or unpasteurized milk. Um, like, I don't know if it's even legal in some states. I know it was in, in uh, Pennsylvania when I lived there, but uh, that was the Amish people because they didn't do that. So I don't know if you can even buy it now, but people do because they think it's good for them. Whatever. So, um, so pasteurization, it does apply heat in like um, spurts. So we can either have the flash pasteurization where we have 71.6 degrees, that's very specific temperature uh, for 15 seconds, or what we typically would see the batch method, uh, anywhere from 63 to 66 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And when we will cycle for 30 minutes at that kind of low high temperature, and then um, cool down for a little bit and then re-expose and then cool down. We can kill microbes this way. Like it says, inactivate most viruses, destroy vegetative states of about 97 to 99, depending on the temperature, percent of bacteria and fungi. Um, we will not kill endospores and we will not kill the heat resistant microbes. So we use this for uh, milk, wine, beer, and other beverages. We know that pasteurization doesn't sterilize, right? you've ever gone to the store and bought yourself some whole milk and uh, it was regular milk, I'm not talking about lactate. You buy like regular old whole, whole milk and you put it in your fridge and let's say you forget about it. I don't drink milk, so I would easily forget about it. Um, it would just sit there in the fridge, just untouched for a very long time. And um, it would be like not even a week probably before it went bad, right? Um, especially if you opened it, you'd be really screwed. But even if you don't open it, it'll go chunky and bad pretty quickly. Um, so that pasteurization, that just proves pasteurization doesn't sterilize. If it was sterile in there, it would be sterile. You couldn't grow anything. Things don't come out of nothing, right? So we know it's not sterile. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had lactate. That's the reason I brought it up. It's like lactate lasts forever, guys. 
It really does. <laughs> it really does. If you don't drink a lot of milk, you don't go through milk very quick. I recommend buying lactate. I buy it because I like to dip my Oreos in milk. So if I buy Oreos, I go buy lactate and it'll last forever. It's like months. I'm not kidding. Months. That it, huh? Cashew milk? Yeah. So there you go. I mean, I'm just saying I don't drink milk really that much, but that's Oreos is the only <laughs> exception. Okay. Um, moist heat methods. Now we're talking about steam under pressure. Now we can achieve sterilization. Now we're adding that pressure in there. We can get that higher temperature. Um, and adding in that moisture helps to, uh, you know, coagulate as well as denature the proteins. So uh, what we do is we have this device called an autoclave. If you guys have heard me talk about it, probably you have, uh, and I will continue probably to talk about it, but uh, these are in every hospital everywhere. Uh, you have to have them, right? So anytime you need to sterilize things that are reusable, like medical instruments, uh, like uh, surgical instruments, what I'm trying to say, and that you will sterilize them in the autoclave. This um, uses uh, like a, a heat jacket and like uh, the pressure, Change the pressure and increases the pressure inside so you can get a higher temperature as far as uh, like i don't want to get into the chemistry of it but you guys probably learned a little bit about pressure and um temperature but yeah 121 degrees celsius uh 15 psi that's pounds per square inch that's the pressure uh, for 20 minutes it's very very typical of autoclaving um if even the media that you guys use in lab even though it's been solid mostly. We've got a few broths, but um, the solid ones will autoclave them. They'll go liquid while they're in the autoclave and we'll get them out. And then um, when they're cool enough to touch and they won't melt the plates, then we'll pour it while it's still liquid and then it solidifies. So that's how that works. Um, so it's very useful in a lot of different applications. Very useful. Very, very widely used. Anytime you see bio trash anywhere, guess where that sucker's going? It's going to be autoclaved. All of them are. Um, sharps containers, they're going to be autoclaved first. So that's how all that's going to work. Even if we don't do it ourselves, somebody somewhere will be doing it. Usually pay people to do them um, in some cases. I had an autoclave at my uh, job in graduate school that you could walk into. It was like a, a room. It was terrifying. Most of them are not that big. I just want to be clear. You can have desktop versions like they did it at the vet, um, had a few shelves on it, or you can have one like we have is pretty small size. Um, in our prep lab. It's like the size of half of this thing down here. Um, maybe the size of that trash can tops, maybe. Um, most of the other places I've worked at have massive autoclaves that are like, you have to wheel them around, um, wheel carts around and push whole carts into it and everything like that. But um, just depends on your application, right? So we have here the uh, basic concept of what an autoclave would be shaped like, what it would look like. You have, of course, have to have a ceiling door that looks an awful lot like it would be on a ship um, because of holding that pressure in, right? But other than that, I mean, you don't need to know all the parts of it. We're just getting some water and some pressure um, in there and heating it up. All right, moving on to the dry heat. Now we have incineration. This is also going to be able to sterilize. Um, we have Bunsen burners like we use in lab. They're going to reach uh, hottest of 1,870, so 1,870 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we have certain furnaces and incinerators that might operate anywhere from 800 degrees Celsius up to 6,500 degrees Celsius, just depending on how, uh, you know, quickly you need something to burn. Um, so we'll ignite and reduce those microbes into ash and gas. So that's pretty much where they're going to go. Um, and that's going to be a total chemical process. It really is chemistry um, at its finest, honestly. So this is, we use this in lab and we can do uh, certain materials uh, can't, can't handle that high of heat. So it has to be just things like um, glass, certain heat resistant glass and then metal does well with it. Um, dry heat methods can also include hot air ovens. These can sterilize. We're talking about uh, 150 to 180 degrees Celsius for two to four hours. So yeah, like literally putting something in a home oven, that would be a very high, high temperature, but um, for you know, four hours and that can sterilize things. So uh, that will reduce, destroy the endospores as well. All right, so cold typically is not going to kill anything. Some, like I said, some microbes will be killed by cold temperatures, don't count on it though, all right? If you're like getting your chicken and you're not real sure if this chicken has a salmonella or not, 
don't just freeze it and assume that that's going to get rid of the salmonella because you could just be delaying the inevitable. So um, just assume freezing isn't going to take care of it. Be sure you cook your stuff all the way through, right? Freezing, you have to do at uh, minus 70 to uh, uh, minus 135 degrees Celsius for it to actually be effective at, um, you know, uh, preserving cultures and things like that because you want it to be very cold. Uh, here we're talking about liquid nitrogen te temperatures and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, your freezer at home isn't going to achieve that. Um, most, some psychrophiles, remember those guys? These are the guys that flourish at um, cold temperatures. So they'll even continue to secrete toxins and stuff like that in those cold temperatures. Um, desiccation is drying something out. Some delicate pathogens can be killed by desiccation. We are talking about like drying things out like beef jerky and stuff. Okay. So that's why we have preservatives and stuff associated with that. You know, we still introduce some heat when we are making, uh, you know, jerky and everything, just because desiccation is not very effective. It will reduce um, the growth of the bacteria, but it won't necessarily kill. Okay. Lyophilization is a combination of freezing and drying. A lot of times what we'll do is put something in some little tubes, spin them in a centrifuge, suck all the air out of the centrifuge and get it super, super cold and freeze that while we're sucking all of the moisture out and the air, okay? Um, so that dries it out at the same time. If you've ever had a vial of a powder of something or seen somebody use a vial of powder that they had to put liquid into and like resuspend it before they were using it, that powder was lyophilized um, almost assuredly. So uh, all of your cultures that we've used in lab, at some point they were lyophilized as well. So I got all of those as powder. Um, all right, moving on to radiation. Radiation can be used for microbial control. That shouldn't be a surprise, y'all. Y'all seen Chernobyl. Do you know I'm old enough that I can remember Chernobyl? I'm that old, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that old, y'all. So... <laughs> So people don't believe that a lot of times. That is a thing that happened that people actually live through. So um, radiation. Uh, here we're talking about atomic activities being disrupted by these rays, essentially, of energy that are going through the um, atmosphere. Uh, things that are going to be useful for you know, microbial control. Gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet radiation. That's mostly what we're going to be talking about. Okay. So you can see here high energy waves on this side. Um, yes, there's infrared and microwaves and radio waves down here. Yes, radio waves like literally like you listen to the radio. That's what that is talking about. All right, irradiation re refers to bombarding the cells or the surface or whatever it is um, with radiation. Okay, no surprise there. So ionizing versus non-ionizing. Ionizing, we have catastrophic mutations. Okay. Um, this is uh, going to be a real, real issue. And then with non-ionizing, we can have DNA have abnormal bonds that can lead to mutations. Now, um, here's an important thing. Ionizing radiation will pass through most barriers, um, whereas non-ionizing radiation will not. If you put a barrier up, it won't be able to make it through for the most part. Okay. All right, let's get into this. Ionizing radiation, gamma rays, X-rays, and cathode rays. I am not talking about um, X-ray uh, machines that used to take pictures of people's bodies. I'm talking about much more powerful X-ray equipment, okay? Um, so it's made for emitting the radiation like at levels for this kind of use, okay? So gamma ray machines, X-ray machines, and cathode ray machines can all be used for sterilization. Um, so remember, our ionizing radiation, like I said, gamma rays and x-rays, the radiation itself will eject orbital electrons. So literally, electrons that are in your molecules in your body right now, the radiation associated with ionizing, the gamma rays and the x-rays, will cause um, electrons to eject from your molecules in your cells, any of them or all of them, okay? You get enough exposure, a lot of your molecules in your whole body can be affected by radiation. Um, and it isn't going to be stopped by your body. So it's going to go through your whole entire body and cause orbital electrons to be shot out, creating ions in your body. Because now you're losing your electrons and now you've got charges associated, positive, right? Associated with that. So then that can lead to uh, mutations in the DNA that are like very severe. It can damage the proteins and it can damage any of the molecules in the whole body, basically. 
Um, so this is what we're talking about with Chernobyl is why we can't go there. Or um, what was it, Fukushima? That was the other one recently. Um, yeah, any of that. I read this story about this, these guys that were like hunting in like Siberia or something. And um, they found this like, like, I don't know if it was a reactor, but it contained some sort of radioactive material. And they didn't know that. They just knew it was warm. And so they were hunting in freaking Siberia. So they carried this thing around with them. So it was warm so they could warm up next to it and whatever. Well, two of the guys died within days of getting home from that. Um, one of the guys survived because he, he was the farthest from it like the whole time. But um, the other guys like slept on it and stuff like that. And this guy um, that survived, he lost his legs, like most of his lower half and um, part of his like, arm and like most of the tissue on his back and all of this stuff as a result of being exposed to this radiation. So that's ionizing radiation, right? We know UV radiation doesn't do that crap. That would be ridiculous. So non-ionizing radiation is UV, okay? It excites your atoms. It raises them to a high energy state and causes things to bond next to each other instead of across. Let me see if I can see, get to a picture of it. Um, anyways, UV radiation, it's gonna, I'm not gonna test you over this, but it's 100 to 400 nanometers. Most lethal we at um, like 250-ish is what we use our lamps at. If you've ever driven around town lately and passed anything integrous at all, then you've probably seen that it is purple anymore, like the light at night. Um, if you've seen any of the medical buildings, a lot of them are, are doing this now. That's, U, that's UV lights. They're using it to prevent the spread of germs, but especially COVID. Um, it's really what they're targeting with that. They say that it's uh, safe for you to walk through it for short periods of time, um, but it's not safe for the viruses, basically is what they're, they're talking about. So um, that's the idea of why they're putting up freaking UV lights everywhere. Just don't go lay down on top of your car and under that UV lamp because it's not going to do you well. It's not going to do you favors. So, not, uh, so this non-ionizing UV is not as penetrating. We know that you can put up a wall and you're safe. You put up a wall like this and have Chernobyl on the other side, you're not going to survive that. You're not. It doesn't care that the wall is there. It doesn't matter if it's cement or anything. You wear a lead apron whenever you're doing um, x-rays and that's cute. But if you get into these levels that we're talking about with sterilization, and everything that ain't going to help you with gamma radiation. So that's the here's big serious stuff. Um, but yeah, so non-ionizing has its place, right? We know that it can be useful for um, sterilizing and mostly disinfecting and that sort of stuff. Um, so here's the picture of what I was talking about. It's not a very good picture. Uh, but here we have A and T binding across from one another, right? We know A to T, G to C. We have already talked about DNA. Um, you get exposed to the UV radiation from the sun, from the freaking, uh, I don't know, integrous lamps or whatever it is. Now your T's are not binding with your A's anymore. Look at that. They're not bound. Those little pink lines aren't there. They're not binding across. Instead, they're binding next to each other. This is called a thymine dimer. Um, if we don't excise this or cut this out of our DNA during our repair stages of our cells, um, then that will become permanent and can lead to uh, mutations in the cells as well. So it's not anywhere near the level of what we see with uh, like gamma radiation and stuff like that, but it is uh, it can be severe. And that's where we get you know things like melanoma and stuff coming from. Um, it does, yeah, so it does this by generating free radicals. Um, it's not quite as strong as causing electrons to eject from the whole molecule, but it does create free radicals, and that's how it creates those inappropriate um, bonds. So we can use this for surfaces, floors, and stuff like that. It's pretty useful, actually. Um, we have that, I don't know if you guys have noticed, there's that like weird hood thing with the glass front in the lab back in the corner, that is a, um, a, you know, supposed to be handling like ESL2 type substances in that, but it has a UV lamp on it in order to sterilize that. So cool. All right, so decontamination by filtration. Decontamination, remember that is going to be mechanical removal. Um, so we can remove most microbes this way, especially if you get small enough filters. That's really all this is about, right? If, this, if the holes in it are small enough, then it can remove anything. We can use this for uh, anything that can't withstand heat. So even things like milk and beer and water purification. 
and the air, of course. We know HEPA filters, yes. Uh, osmotic pressure here. Now we're talking about putting things like packing them in salt or in sugar, right? Uh, this will lead to plasmolysis, so sh shrinking down the cells to the point that they aren't able to function and can even die. Um, anyway, so that can be effective. All right, let's go on to the chemicals now. Really moving on to the chemicals. That was a good segue, I guess, talking about osmotic pressure. Uh, all right, what are we going to say about the chemicals? They can be aqueous or they can be tinctures. For the most part, that's what they're going to be. They can be gas um, or, and they can have solids and whatever, but like most of them are going to be aqueous or tinctures. Aqueous in water, tinctures, alcohol or alcohol water mixture. Okay, that's all that means. All right, so when you're dealing with chemicals, do you want rapid action in low concentration, solubility in water or alcohol? Because that's what all of your other stuff is already dissolved in. Broad spectrum microbicidal action. You want microbicidal, not microbostatic, right? Because you'd rather kill these suckers than let them come back. Um, so you want broad spectrum, but you don't want it to hurt the people. Um, penetration of inanimate surfaces can lead to sustaining a cumulative or persistent action. But we've heard about some surfaces being impregnated basically with silver nowadays, or even your say clothes. You can buy clothes that are impregnated with silver to make them antimicrobial. Um, this would be something that would be persistent action. Some of these uh, can be inactivated by an organic matter. So ideally we want to avoid that. Non-corrosive, non-staining properties, sanitizing, um, and deodorizing properties, and then affordable and readily available. All of this is just like, you know, dreams, I feel like. But um, do the best we can to achieve all of these if we can. Organic matter, by the way, when I talk about things being uh, susceptible or inactivated by organic matter, I am talking about things like pus and feces and blood and whatever else might come along with a patient, vomit, all that. Some of this stuff doesn't hold up to that. All right, our high level germicides, they're going to be sterilizing if you use them properly, all right? These are critical items uh, that you can't use heat on to sterilize. Catheters, heart, lung, equipment, and any implants. Um, then we have the intermediate level germicides. These are not going to kill the endospores or um, and may not kill the resistant pathogens, but other things will be you know, controlled. So here, respiratory equipment and thermometers. And then the low level germicides, um, these are things that will control some things like vegetative bacteria and vegetative fungal cells, but not um, all the viruses, not endospores, none of that. So here, electrodes, straps, furniture that touches skin, and uh, but not the mucous membranes. Is that, that's gross. They're gross. Mucous membranes are gross, y'all. All right. Um, all right. So we kind of already talked about some of this stuff, but when you're considering um, how you want your microbial chemicals to work. You want to consider your nature of your microbes that you're being exposed to, um, the nature of material that you're treating, the degree of contamination, the time of, of exposure, and the strength and chemical action of the germicide. One of these I wanted to make mention of so we can put this into context. Time of exposure. If you have a chemical that has to sit on a surface for four hours to sterilize something, um, that might not be the choice that you want to go with for cleaning your patient's bed right? If you've got new people coming in every freaking 20 minutes that you've got to cycle through to see them in the ER or working in an urgent care clinic or something like that, you can't wait four hours for this thing to take effect. So that's an example of what we're getting at here. All right. So again, same targets as before, proteins, nucleic acid, cell wall, and cell membrane. We'll start with the halogens. Yes, we are talking about literal halogens over there. The second from the right um, on the periodic table of elements, fluorine, uh, bromine, chlorine, iodine, okay? These guys are microbicidal and sporicidal. So they can be used to sterilize. Um, they're active ingredients in a third of uh, all antimicrobial chemicals that you will ever use, okay? Um, chlorine was one of the main chemicals recommended by the WHO for cleaning and disinfecting surfaces um, in the context of COVID. So uh, what's the number one probably the number one uh, most uh, well-known chlorine containing compound that we could think of, bleach, bleach, right? So it's very, very effective. Bleach is very effective. There's a reason why it's used for decades and decades. Super effective. Um, so chlorine compounds like bleach 
uh, we can include liquid and gaseous chlorine as well. So chlorine gas is pretty, pretty stout there. Um, we have the hypochlorites, um, which includes the bleach and then chloramine. These are often used for uh, treating water. Um, anyways, these guys will denature enzymes and that will stop the metabolic reactions in these cells. And they're less, uh, less effective when exposed to light, pH, alkaline pH, because these are acids, typically lean acid, acidic, and then um, or organic matter, excess amounts of it. So uh, indications for using, using these. Uh, disinfecting water, sewage, wastewater. I am not telling you to drink bleach, okay? I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you if you had to put dilute amounts in it, uh, in your water, it can be somewhat effective at controlling microbes. I'm not saying do it right now, every day, but I'm saying if it came down to, you know, dire situation, okay? Hypochlorites like bleach, because it's going to kill all the bacteria in your body too. So that's not good either. So just keep that in mind. Emergency situations are emergency situations though, right? So hypochlorites like bleach, we mostly use these in uh, healthcare, treating wounds, uh, disinfecting bedding, instruments, sanitizing food and equipment, and in restaurants, pools, and spas. Some dermatologists even recommend um, taking baths in bleach in very low concentrations of bleach, but bleach nonetheless can help deal with um, certain types of uh, skin infections uh, or um, other anti, like not anti, I guess, inflammatory skin conditions like um, hydradenitis separativa and stuff that's related to that because inflammation of that, excuse me, can't talk today, the inflammation caused by those things can actually be lessened by the bleach itself, let alone controlling the microbes. So um, don't just go home and, you know, bathe in a whole thing of bleach. Look up online, talk to your doctor about what concentration you should be using before you try something like that, please. Okay, um, and it's not meant for like full on hours of bathing. It's meant for like 15 minutes or something. All right, chloramines, water treatment. All right, iodine. This can kill endospores and destroy other microbes as well. It's pretty effective for that. We have free iodine in solution and iodophores. This is combining iodine with alcohol as a tincture, basically. Um, I don't need to worry too much about this um, functions, but it's going to interfere with the proteins. Um, it can be, like it's saying down here, I iodophores and iodine can be extremely irritating, and some of them were even banned. Iodophores are, again, complexes of iodine and alcohol. They've replaced free iodine now because they're less irritating and less prone to staining skin, okay? So here we're talking about betadine, uh, povidone iodine, and isodine. Uh, you guys probably seen these and maybe even not even known about it. If you've ever seen a, any patients that get in their uh, antecubital region swabbed with like orangey, it's like brown orange color, um, that's iodine. Um, they might use it for central lines as well. If somebody is allergic to chlorhexidine, which is a thing, maybe you don't know what chlorhexidine is, but it's used in like surgical scrubs and they often use it for um, things like central lines and stuff like that. Um, if you can be allergic to it. And if you are, then they will try iodine. You can be allergic to both though, unfortunately. And it turns out that um, if you're allergic to iodine, you're allergic typically to shellfish too, just FYI, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about it. I just know that. Okay. <laughs> Next, the phenol, carbolic acid. We remember carbolic acid thanks to Lister. He was the guy that introduced basically sanitizing the uh, surgical suites. Um, so that's phenol, all right? It is pretty toxic and very irritating, um, but it's very good for, um, you know, uh, controlling uh, protein function in microbes, disrupting it. Um, so we don't use a whole lot of phenol straight up, but it is used as the standard that our new phenolic, which are related to phenol, our phenolic disinfectants are compared to that still even to this day because it is so um, effective. But phenol, now we only use it in drains, cesspools, and animal quarters, places where people aren't going to be because it can be so um, toxic. All right, uh, carbolic acid or phenol, um, first antimicrobial chemical used. We talked about it as being germicidal with Lister. It is toxic and irritating, whereas the phenolics are less so, um, but we can't, they're still bad. They're still not great. So included within phenolics, we have triclosan. Now, maybe you guys don't remember about triclosan, 
but this was something they included in like every single hand soap and every single hand sanitizer in the entire freaking everywhere you went for a very long time. Um, it started collecting in the environment. It was seen in like our drinking water and stuff like that. And so they banned the use of it. And now um, it's only licensed for healthcare settings. Now it is technically uh, antibiotic. Um, it is considered to be. So uh, when that your microbes are getting um, resistant to it because of the exposure, the widespread exposure to it. It was everywhere. I mean, freaking Bath and Body Works all over the place. Uh, chlorhexidine is probably the more common one that we know of. Hibiclens, um, Hibitane, and Paradex. This is what we most commonly will be using for surgical hand scrubs, um, surgical prep. And we have, uh, you can also buy chlorhexidine for like mouthwash and other things. Um, it is pretty effective, but it is not sterilizing. It says effects on viruses and fungi are variable, I guess. Um, anyways, yeah. Um, what do I want to say about it? Low toxicity. It's pretty low toxicity. You can become allergic to it. And you can use it over the counter. Um, you can buy it, by the way. Um, Hibiclens, you can just buy it at like Walgreens and stuff like that. And Hibiclens, that's like the soap version of the chlorhexidine. It's literally what they use for scrubs in a surgical uh, setting. So if you have any sort of skin um, infection, something like that, that you find um, needs to be cleaned better more than usual, then Hibiclens might be the the way to go. Of course, talk to your doctor first. I'm not going to advise you to start showering with hippie cleanse. Um, alcohol, um, most viruses, bacteria, and fungi are going to be affected, but it's not sterilizing, right? Not everything's controlled here. Um, we know they're colorless, they're hydrocarbons, they have an OH group, right? That's the alcohol part of it. Um, they work at uh, concentrations of 50% or higher to dissolve membrane lipids. We already talked about how that it could affect cell, cell walls earlier. So membrane lipids, cell walls, and even affecting uh, the proteins. We can coagulate proteins as well. So pretty effective, the alcohol. Problem is that it can affect your nervous system. Now, that should be obvious. That's why people drink it, right? But um, yeah, <laughs> you're not supposed to inhale the fumes either. So let's see, let's see. Um, ethyl and isopropyl alcohol are the ones that we can buy um, over the counter for microbial control. Um, we can use them as a base for tinctures as well. 70%, um, I want you guys to be very, I want to be very clear about this. 70% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol, I might prefer isopropyl, okay? 70% isopropyl alcohol is way more effective than 100%. That is because that water that's added in there is needed for protein coagulation. So if you don't have the water in enough of an amount, then you're not going to coagulate your proteins. It's not going to be as effective. Don't buy that 95% thinking you're doing something good. Buy the 70, okay? 70% to 95% ethyl alcohol. And we have isopropyl alcohol as well. You can buy um, in that range. But like I said, aim for the 70%, please. Um, they both have high uh, rates of evaporation, which is a problem. Um, and we do see alcohol-based hand, sanitizer, hand sanitizers with primarily ethyl alcohol. This, I think, more has to do with the smell of it. I'm more resistant to evaporation than the isopropyl. Isopropyl, um, we know it evaporates faster, but it's more microbicidal, so it's more effective. It's less expensive than the ethyl alcohol. Um, and the problem, though, is that the vapors can adversely affect the nervous system more so than with the ethyl alcohol. So that's give and take, but um, if we're talking about effectiveness, it's isopropyl all the way. Oxidizing agents. This is literally what we had talked about in the past with things being, um, you know, susceptible to ox oxygen-based compounds. So we're really um, concentrating our anaerobics, but you get it in enough high enough of concentration, you can kill anything. So our oxygen-based products. This is mostly going to be hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. In case you guys didn't know, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Um, so we can be potentially um, sterilizing if we use this appropriately, right? When you buy it at the store, 3% hydrogen peroxide, this is not going to be sterilizing, but you can use this for wound cleansing, mouthwash, and bed sore care. Um, at high concentrations, so we're talking 35%, hydrogen peroxide, um, we can sterilize um, and use that to, um, to sterilize 
instruments that couldn't be exposed to um, heat and stuff like that. So um, it's pretty useful for that. It's more useful for the anaerobes, of course. We already said that in the past. Um, we know it's colorless and it's a liquid. Uh, its germicidal effects, effects are due to toxic reactive oxygen, which we know, um, and it can be sterilizing. You can even use it like vaporized, so almost in a gaseous form, and um, use uh, enclosed spaces like this whole room. I could fill this room with vaporized hydrogen peroxide and sterilize everything in it. So that's called a chemiclave. I mean, this is what we talk about autoclave, chemiclave, when we're using just chemicals to do that. Okay. Um, it's most, most widely used as a disinfectant and not a sterilizing agent. Ozone has similar effects. We use this mostly for like air conditioners and cooling towers. Detergents, moving on. Detergents, these are going to target um, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, but they are not sterilizing, okay? Um, we have polar molecules that act as surfactants. Um, anionic are limited, so the ones with negative charge aren't very good. We want the ones with cationic or positive charge, okay? Um, this includes quaternary ammonia compounds. Quaternary ammonium co compounds or quats. Um, ammonium in general is going to have a positive charge to it, just FYI. So if you ever hear about ammonia, then it's going to have that going on. But that positive actually helps it get into the cell membranes better because um, they will really want to get associated with those negatively charged heads of the phospholipids. So that's what is aiding them there. So again, we're poking, basically causing holes in cell membranes. Um, detergents have limited use. Um, they're ineffective against tuberculosis bacteria, hepatitis virus, pseudomonas, and endospores. So we've got a lot of stuff getting through here. But we usually will, uh, will com combine these things with other things. So that's what we see with Hibiclens, right? We see chlorhexidine combined with a detergent effect of it. So anyways, here's our surfactants. Like we said, limited microbicidal power. Um, they're going to disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane. Usually we're going to you know, mix it with something else. So here's an example of how that would be um, oriented. We have our positively charged and all these groups attached to it. And then our hydrocarbon chain. Okay, so that's hydrophobic, our hydrocarbon chain. And this is the charged region. Um, so this is benzyl, the head of this one is benzylconium chloride. So this CN, 2HN, that's just the number of those that you could have going on down there. So that's the long hydrocarbon chain for that one. Okay. Benzalkonium chloride. We have this, uh, if you ever got your uh, ears pierced at like Claire's, which I got my ears pierced at Claire's when I was like 10 or something. But um, yeah, they gave you this solution and it was benzalkonium chloride to you know, clear, clean your piercings. It's not recommended now, but you know, at the time you can buy it still, benzalkonium chloride. It's pretty safe for like your skin and stuff like that. Um, anyways. Quats, we already talked about, not very germicidal. Heavy metal compounds, they're going to affect the function of proteins. This is going to include things like mercury and silver. Yes, I said mercury and silver. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. You think you don't see you no know, mercury in your lives. Organic mercury tinctures um, are fairly effective antiseptics. Organic mercurials serve as preservatives in cosmetics. Y'all didn't even know it, did you? Ophthalmic solutions, talking about your um, uh, contacts, and then other substances. Uh, yeah, talking about mercury. Um, it's effective, though. In, in low concentrations, it shouldn't be harmful. Silver nitrate solutions are used uh, for topical germicides and for ointments. So we know silver is pretty effective as an antimicrobial. It's relatively safe for people to be exposed to. Um, they are oligodine oligodynamic or oligodynamic, however you want to say it, I don't care, um, but they will be toxic in very minute, small quantities. Um, mercury and silver have significance as germicides. Anything else, even gold, because it's showing gold here, stopping growth of microbes, it's not super effective at it. Um, so we're reaching more for silver and mercury. Um, it can be toxic in high, higher amounts, and especially if ingested, can cause allergic reactions. Um, it's neutralized by biological wastes. And microbes can develop resistance. Um, all right. Uh, heavy metals, uh, we're talking about uh, tinctures, like we said already. I'm not going to go back through all this. The silver ones, I do want to mention silver sulfadiazine, which I think we should be aware of. Uh, it's used for burn treatment. And yes, we know that there is 
silver in it. There's a button on here. I keep pressing, sorry. Um, silver, of course, was what we just talked about. But the sulfa, and we kind of already talked about sulfas, right? We talked about um, sulfa, uh, was it sulfa methoxazole? Yeah, I think it was. Um, and then uh, trimethoprim, right, for our SXT, for our uh, Kirby Bauer experiment. Anyways, sulfas in general. If there's a sulfa there, it's going to be affecting the folic acid synthesis pathway. Those are antibiotics. We will talk about those in the next chapter. You don't need to worry about it too much now. But um, this is a combination. You can see here we've got silver going on and we've got a sulfa going on. So it's useful. It's double. Um, so yeah, if you get a burn, they usually slap that stuff on you. Um, even colloidal silver, you can, people would drink that for a while. People were drinking that. I don't know. And you can incorporate, like I was saying earlier, silver ions into hard surfaces and textiles. Um, Maybe, yeah. Yeah, they were drinking it. Like, yeah, whatever, people. Like, <laughs> you can turn blue from that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyway, so um, aldehydes, now we're talking about killing endospores and all other microbes. We're getting back into some really good stuff for sterilization. Um, the problem is this stuff is pretty toxic. So glutaraldehyde um, can disrupt enzymes and stuff like that. And then we also have orthophthalaldehyde. That's a good word that we all want to try to say. Um, thankfully, there's a shortened version, OPA. Okay. So glutaraldehyde is kind of unstable. Um, especially with pH changes. And then the OPA is more expensive, but it is also more stable than the glutaraldehyde. Um, glutaraldehyde, rapid, broad spectrum, can be used for sterilizing. It's potent in the presence of organic matter. It sterilizes um, materials that would otherwise be damaged by heat. So it is useful, it has its place. Formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a um, intermediate to high level disinfectant. It is extremely toxic. We use this as an embalming fluid for a reason. Um, we can disinfect surgical instruments um, and uh, formalin. If you've ever heard of formalin, that's the aqueous version of this. So it's mixed with water. And then OPA, like we were just saying, orthophthalaldehyde, similar to glutaraldehyde, faster action. It doesn't irritate, but it does not destroy endospores. So it's non sterilizing. All right, next, the gaseous sterilants and um, disinfectants. Ethylene oxide, um, it kills endospores, it can sterilize, it's great, uh, but <laughs> there's a big but with this one, okay? It is explosive, it is highly explosive. So we have to have it in a high percentage of carbon dioxide or fluorocarbon in order to uh, prevent, uh, you know, sudden explosions from happening from just even minor, you know, sparks or anything like that. It can damage lungs, eyes, and mucous membranes, and it is a carcinogen. So we don't really want to have it in place around like people. So that's kind of awful. Um, it can be used to generate a chemiclave, like I was saying before, a chemical sterilization, sterilization within like a whole room. So you can get a whole bunch of like stuff in one room and sterilize it all at once with this. Um, anyways, chlorine dioxide is a similar gas, but it is um, less harmful. And they use this to disinfect Senate after the anthrax attacks. Um, they can use it to treat water as well. The acids and the alkalis, we should know, we should be aware of the effectiveness of these, right? We know that um, change in pH can affect uh, the uh, protein structure and all of that. So no surprise that this would fall into this. We're mostly talking about um, like food-based uh, acids for the most part here, okay? So like acetic acid, which is, by the way, vinegar, um, propionic acid, uh, lactic acid, that's also another obvious one, I feel like, benzoic acid and sorbic acid. You can even see um, ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, used as um, a preservative as well. So then they also have on here aqueous ammonium oxide. That's going to be a base, a basic. But that, if you've ever heard of ammonium oxide, you probably have. Look at the back of your deodorant next time and tell me that it's not related to this because it probably is. Um, so they, yeah, so that's going to be detergents cleansers, and deodorizers. Essential oils can be effective at stopping microbial growth. Check it out if you're interested. All right, and these are some examples of uh, antimicrobial products that are available on the market um, and that you may or may not have encountered. So talking about things like Lysol, sanitizing wipes, Clorox sanitizing wipes, and all of these things. 
um, so interesting to put this all into perspective, I feel like. So. All right, so our question for the chapter, why aren't there any effective methods for sterilizing animate surfaces, like regularly used? Why aren't we sterilizing them all the time? Because basically you don't want to sterilize your skin all the time, right? You need your microbes that are on your skin. Um, and plus a lot of that stuff is usually damaging to tissues as well. Okay, let's do a couple of questions on the thing. You know what I'm talking about. Just a couple, that'll be your thing you take your picture of. All right, all right, all right. Maybe. We'll just do a couple of questions, then we'll pop into the lab stuff. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Remember, you can always join. Whew, it's hot. All right, what is decontamination? All right, this is gonna be the mechanical removal. It says inanimate surfaces, it could be both, but um, that does count, so mechanical removal. All right, next question. Like I said, we'll maybe do three or four questions, and that's it. What is a sepsis? All right, so this one's going to be removal of microbes from an animate surface. All right, um, what does it mean if a method is microbicidal? Make sure you check all the answers. Yep, it kills microbes. All right, so we'll stop it here. Um, if you guys want to take a picture, and then I will pull up the thing for the lab stuff. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, uh, we don't want to go up there because it's hot and gross. All right. Yes, this is the same. Yeah. yeah, it's the same one as what was recorded, so don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, of course, yeah. No, he had a uh, oh, oh, green. Okay. So That's similar. I think it's similar. That's not a little thing. Right. It's just a That would run. You can't be here. Yeah. Yeah. I can't blame you for that. Um, I don't blame you for that. It's just awkward like that. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope not. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, let's do it. All right. Okay, safety stuff. There might be a question or two about safety. It's not gonna be anything crazy. It's gonna be something like this one, which would be like, where should broken glass be disposed? Yes, that's sharp container. That one should be pretty straightforward. All right, for the stains, which we're about to get into, know the steps for the stains in order. So yes, I'm talking about things like, um, uh, what's the gram stain? Crystal violet, then iodine, then alcohol rinse, then saffronin, for example. So that would be the gram stain. So know that and know each stain used and its purpose. And what I'm talking about there is like crystal violet, what does it do? You know, like how is it getting us the answer that we're getting to? That sort of stuff. So um, be aware of that. Uh, what positive and negative look like for each stain and what color they should be. And if you could pick them out of a mixed sample, um, I would be able to. I'm not gonna have you pick it out of a mixed sample, by the way, it's just gonna be like one positive or negative. But um, if you know them well enough to pick them apart, like on the same field, then you're in good shape. And then what happens if you skip a step? I could say skip a step in any of these, but I'm really primarily probably gonna ask you about the gram stain. So be aware of that. All right, let's get into it. Or it could be more than one. What is the purpose of heat fixing? So the heat fixing itself, what does it do for us? I like this could be louder.
All right. So yes, adhere it to the slide and kill it. You guys did great. Good job. I'm very impressed. All right, what is the counter stain that is used in the gram stain? All right, the counter stain, um, you guys must have got this one. Counter stain is the one that we're going to use to stain like at the end. So that is um, the last stain to really use. Um, for the gram stain, that's gonna be saffronin. All right, what color will a gram negative bacteria be after the gram stain? So, uh, yep, so red. <laughs> you guys are doing great on this. That's good, though. Um, so red, yeah. So I won't ever put pink and red as a choice, just FYI, because I know that saffronin looks a bit pink when you look at it in the microscope, but red is easier for me to remember because red versus purple rather than pink versus purple. Um, I did want to mention that if you are somebody who looks into a microscope and the thing that I have in there, I'm asking about if it's gram positive or negative, um, and you aren't really sure if it's pink or you know, pink, red or purple, right? You're looking at it, you're not sure of the color. You can ask, okay? If the question is, uh, is the specimen that you see in the microscope gram positive or gram negative, and you wanna know, is this pink or purple? You know, because it looks so pink when I look at it, I can't tell if it's purple or not. Then I would say, uh, I would just look at you probably, and I would say, it's red. And that's, I would tell you what the answer is, because you have to know that red meant gram negative, right? So that's okay to ask questions like that if you can't tell the color. I've had students who were literally colorblind, so um, I don't mind that part of it. As long as it's not giving away the answer, it's your job to know that red means negative. But All right. All right what is the first stain used in the capsule stain? So that is going to be Congo red. Most of you guys got that one. That's when we put the little drops on it, mix the stuff in, and then spread it out like a blood smear. Okay. So that was Congo red. It's going to ask some questions about it. All right, could be more than one. What type of stain is Congo red? I'll let you know it is two of these. Two of these are correct. Okay, so it is going to be a background stain. We all kind of knew that one. That was no surprise there. Um, it's also negative. It happens to be that negative stains stain the background. Because we have a negative charge on the outside of our cells, um, they're gonna, that's going to repel the stain. Um, therefore, it's going to stain the background instead of the cell. Okay, uh, this is a pure culture. What stain is pictured? So that is an endospore saying, great job. So those little green, green structures, those are the endospores, right? All right, so what is the term for the red structures in the image? All right, so the red structures on this one, those are our vegetative cells. Those are our um, metabolically active, you know, multiplying, all that stuff, um, whereas endospores are completely dormant. 
and they stain green. Remember, we use that stain malachite green to stain them. And that stains the endospores, but not regular cells. So we had to counter stain with saffronin for that one. So what is the following? What the following would be acid fast positive? All right, this is mycobacterium flei. Just mycobacterium, that's the only one that's going to be acid fast. So remember, acid fast, I did this for the other class. I guess I did this for you guys. I should just find a marker. Acid fast. I want to erase this so I don't want to look for a Mycobacterium. And then we have uh, the ones that have endospores. And these are going to be Bacillus and Clostridium. So those are the ones that you like. These, this is always going to be this, and these are always going to be that, and vice versa. Um, and there's other ones that you're going to be asked about at some point, um, whether it's going to be cell shape, which could be uh, most of the room that we're going to have in our lab. You know, just kind of shape. It's going to be either a bacillus, or it's going to be copper, right? That's really all we saw in our lab. That's what we have, and that's what I got on the slide for the cell box. So bacillus, um, you can just like discern uh, the shape of a cell if it is called like bacillus serious, right? Um, or you ask a question about which of the following has rod shape, and this one was called bacillus serious. It's an example, right? Not the only one. All right, um, Hawkeye. This one's pretty straightforward. If I were to put something on there that said. Staphylococcus, anything, right? Then you would know that that was an example of cockeye. It has to be shaped like that because it's in the name. That's just an example. Lucky that um, that one also has uh, arrangement. So the um, arrangement ones, the three are much more going to be staph, staphylo, or strepto. Remember, staphylo is irregular, bunches, and then strepto is going to be chains. You guys know what cockeye and bacillus are, right? Rods and uh, I'll write it on here just in case somebody does it. Okay, uh, so examples, of course, staphylo, like staphylococcus, anything. So I'll just put this on here so you know that it's the same. And then strepto, streptococcus, whatever. Again, these are just examples. It could be other things. Um, it might not have staphylococcus for the cockeye. It might have just FYI, like enterococcus or something like that. But be able to recognize that caucus in there. And that's what I'm talking about. All right. So those are examples. But these ones, acid fast, it's always going to be mycobacteria. And endospore is always going to be bacillus and clostridium. Okay. All right. What is the primary stain used in the acid fast stain? No, I felt like I saw something in the weather about it. Okay, like I saw like on of all places on Instagram, I saw um like the weatherman talking about how like the Sierra blizzard is supposed to blow through here or something, and it's supposed to snow overnight. But it's just blowing snow. It's not anything crazy, but snow, man. I didn't even bring a coat. 
All right, cobble fusion, cobble fusion. Now, cobble fusion is lipid soluble. So we know we have the waxy coating on the mycobacterium. That wax, do you guys remember what it's called? It's called mycolic acid. So that's that waxy coating. So carbo fusion is lipid soluble and wax is a, has a lipid. So that's why it stains that way. I was talking about weather and I got distracted. In what staining procedure did we use steam? All right, end of score, that is correct. Um, remember, we're gonna be using that heat, that steam to force that malachite green into the uh, endospores themselves. The vegetative cells won't hold on to it if you do it properly. All right, which of the following structures allow for bacterial motility? You can select more than one. How do bacteria get around? Oh, does it? Well, the answer is only one of them, by the way. <laughs> Surprise. This is one of those ones I didn't set up the trick very well. Yeah, so this one's flagella. And they only have flagella. That's the only way they get around. Remember, uh, bacteria, they do have fimbriae. That's for attachment. And the pili is for sometimes attachment, but also for transferring their genetic information, right? Horizontal gene transfer. And then the cilia is something we see mostly on eukaryotes. Okay, so here's all the stains that we learned. Simple stain, remember that's just for getting contrast. The gram stain tells us the difference between bacteria based on their cell envelopes, mostly their cell walls. Um, acid fast stain, whether or not it has mycolic acid. Capsule, whether it has a capsule. We know that that's for sticking onto surfaces as well as evading the phagocytes. Uh, wet mount for motility, and then endospore, whether or not it has endospores to, you know, uh, go dormant and hide out till things get good again. Okay, next is ELISA. Um, I say know this test inside and out. Be sure you understand the mechanisms of it, okay? Remember, there's two kinds. Oh, well, we'll do this first. What does the E in ELISA stand for? Yep, so this is uh, enzyme, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Good job. All right, indirect ELISA. Remember, there's two kinds indirect and then direct. All right, so this is exactly right. Um, the indirect ELISA is going to be asking, does the patient have the antibody? Um, the direct asks, does the patient have the antigen? Right. Okay, so know the principles of how the assay works. What are antibodies and antigens? That is going to be on the test. I'm absolutely going to ask you about both of them. There's one question that says, what are antibodies? And the next question right below it says, what are antigens? So they're going to have definitions for you to pick from. Um, FYI, you're not ever going to have more than five choices because it's Scantron. Just so, so you know. Bring uh, number two pencils, by the way. Mine are crappy. So be sure you have your own. <laughs> you don't want to use my eraser. Um, right. So indirect versus direct. Indirect, we are looking for the antibody. So we have to know the antigen, right? We have to have that. Um, direct, we're looking for the antigen, so we have to have a known antibody. Uh, how the color change happens, that's the enzyme on our secondary antibody, right? That one um, is going to cause cleavage of the substrate when it gets added in, if it's stuck around, um, and that'll cause the color change to happen. So color change is always positive. Rapid testing, this is just talking about how this is very similar to uh, the COVID home testing, for example. Um, you have like a whole line of what's basically antibodies against the COVID antigen on that little piece of paper. And then you put the sample in after you've mixed it in your nose, mix it with the stuff, and it travels down the little paper. 
and if it hits the line and it has the antigen, then the antibody will uh, cleave something and cause a color change for that line to appear, basically. That's how that works. So similar concept, different format. So remember that this is something that applies to all immunoassays, not just ELISA. All right, DNA stuff. I say online stuff. That's what I'm talking about with the little paper that I had you guys I sent to use. And then the transformation simulation. This shouldn't be too crazy um, compared to what we already did. So what does PCR do? What is the point? All right, so it amplifies DNA samples. Now, I want to be clear, there is a question on the test that's going to ask you if, um, like, if you start with one piece of DNA, one double strand of DNA, and you go through four cycles of PCR, how many strands will you have as a result? Now, to me, it's obvious because I've told you, like, you go from one, you split it apart, and you make a copy for each, right? So one goes to two. So each of those is going to go to two. So that's four. So you're doubling at each cycle. It's not crazy stuff, okay? So just think about it that way. If you need to draw out your DNA strands, that's fine. So a lot of people do that. So um, it will ask you that though. It'll be four cycles, just FYI. And I'll give you choices. And I feel like they're all pretty reasonable. All right. Um, which DNA fragment is the largest? Be sure you look at all of them and read all your choices. Okay, so this is 35 KBP. KBP stands for kilobase pairs. So we're talking about thousands of base pairs there. Um, BP is base pair. So 100 BP uh, is the blue, 1200 BP. Then we have red is uh, 4000 BP, and the yellow is 35,000 BP. If you have a hard time with the kilo and stuff like that, you're more than welcome to write it out on your scratch papers when you take the test. All right, which of the following DNA fragments would travel the farthest on an agarose gel? Yes, the smallest ones, smallest ones are gonna travel fastest. They don't get as caught up in the gel. Good job. So what type of cells are capable of taking up exogenous DNA? So yes, the term for that is competent, or you could say the definition of competent really would be cells that are capable of taking up exogenous DNA, okay? So competent. All right, for the DNA stuff, uh, I say DNA structure and function. I'm really just talking about knowing the basics so you understand the questions. I'm not gonna get crazy in the questions on it. Um, DNA fragment sizes, like we just went over with, know what they mean. Agarose gel electrophoresis principles, we did talk about moving the smaller ones faster and the larger ones get stuck, but also know that they move towards the positive end in the you know, apparatus because DNA has that negative charge, right? Um, how PCR works in a practical sense, that is me referring to the fact that I'm gonna ask you to start with one, what you end up with after four, okay? Um, and we know that it multiplies, so there, there's that. Uh, so that we're clear, one of the things that people got wrong on the test pretty routinely was uh, saying that the steps in PCR were polymerase, chain, and reaction. A lot of people picked that one. Uh, the real answer is denature, anneal, elongate. So denature, split your, your strands apart. Anneal, stick your primers on there. Anneal means to stick the, something to something. Um, and then elongate, just adding the nucleotides that are you know, corresponding to it. So 
that's the steps for PCR. Um, bacterial transformation, no, the steps, that part wasn't hard. Um, and then the results for each type of media. That's not too hard. I just don't want you to get tripped up on it because I, there is a question that's going to ask you what products are made on this media. Okay. So know the three types of media and what products are made and you'll be good to go. Uh, plasmids, what are they? Another question that trips everybody up on this test. A plasmid is DNA. That's the molecule that it is, DNA. Um, they code, they have genes that code for protein, but they themselves are DNA just like the chromosome. All right, for the eukaryotes, I say review your drawings. Now, I'm tell, told most people what's going to be in the freaking eukaryotes, so I'm going to tell you guys too. But which organism is this first? how my feet hurt more in these like loafers than they did in the heels. Okay, uh, penicillium, that's correct. If it, you know, uh, it's definitely a fungus, you can tell that, and the two funguses that we really looked at were penicillium and aspergillus, right? Penicillium, if you remember, P, penicillium, P, purple or pink, whatever color you want to call that, purple or pink, P. Okay. All right. What is the name of this organism? So this is one that is not going to be on the test, if you remember which one I said it wasn't. I just did not update the picture. I didn't update this. I have to use that test. That is GRDS. And it's very clearly a picture that did not come from like my microscope, right? Because um, those things in our microscopes were like gray and colorless and awful looking and hard to find. Um, it did not look like that. So we're not putting Giardia in the test, like I said. What uh, That will be one of the options for your choices, okay? But what you will see is one that looks kind of similar to Giardia. Uh, it's a little bit larger. And um, it has flagella for sure, and it is pink in the same color. From what we looked at, okay, and it is called Trichomonas. Okay, that's what you're gonna see. <laughs> Trichomonas. All right, that's what you get for sticking around for the lab review. All right, eukaryotes, these are organisms. Remember the organisms that you had to draw. I am gonna ask something about one of the eggs, it's not gonna be a difficult question, but just re familiarize yourselves with some of the eggs. Um, I know that they're big, remember that they are big. They are not 100x size, right? Um, the trophozoite versus the cyst. Remember, trophozoite, troph, just like autotroph or heterotroph or whatever troph, like we're talking about eating and getting energy. Trophozoites, they need energy because they're moving around. They're metabolically active. They're eating. Cysts are just like endospores. They're dormant, okay? Um, and be able to identify things based on differences. I will ask you about how you contract the disease from one of those guys that happens to be a helmet, okay? It will be one of them that's on your paper, just FYI. I'm not gonna pick some random one out of nowhere. Okay, general bacterial growth. This is talking about media like slants and, and plates and broths and stuff. So those culture techniques and things like um, colony morphology, which is the first question, sorry which is not a term used to describe colony morphology. This is a difficult one. All right, so this is hyphae. Hyphae refers to um, basically the extensions on mold, like when you get a fungus and they don't get those hairs growing out like that, that's hyphae. Um, so that's not colony morphology as far as describing like the shapes of the growth on the plate. Now, just familiarize yourselves with the words of what we might use to describe colonies. Um, I'm going to have them along with lists of other words from lab. You'll have to tell me which one is the colony morphology term, which one is cell shape term, which one is cell arrangement term, sort of that sort of thing, okay? So be familiar with colony morphology terms. I'm not gonna ask you to define what umbonate means, okay? Just so you know.
what is the name of this type of culture? It's hard to see it in picture. I hate that I picked this one. But this is basically the same one that we used in our blacktop piece. Right, so this is a slant. It was meant to be as hard to see it in the picture though. All right, what was this organism? How was this organism isolated? By what means? All right, great. So this is a streak plate. I'm glad that we remember what it is. Also remember what's the streak plate. Here's the plate. You started to put the trap down. That's number one. You put through it and zigzag it a couple times. That's number two. You do it again a couple times. That's number three. And then you do it again and you jiggle jaggle all the way out and see what you know, right? Most of your isolated individual colonies will appear in quadrants. Supposed to. I know ours didn't work that way, but normal situation. Supposed to. All right. All right. Which arrangements of bacteria do you observe? I will say it's just one. All right, so this one was strepto, so that's the change. Sometimes they fold back on one another, but they're still chains. All right, what is the name of the shape of these bacteria? It's not one of those, by the way. All right, so these are spirillum. They're just kind of spiral shaped. It is a shape that you know you're expected to know. But my slides, I don't have any of that in the slide. So I only have slides of bacillus and cocci. So lucky you, <laughs> lucky you guys. All right, uh, know your terms of your colony morphology. Like I said, you don't need to be able to define those necessarily, but be able to pick out which ones are terms referring to colony morphology. Media types: slants, plates, rough. Know the difference, kind of, with those. Um, isolation techniques, really I'm only talking about the streak plate, and uh, cell shapes and arrangements, which we kind of already went through. Okay, let's talk about microscopes and how to use them properly. If you observe a specimen at 40x objective and have a 10x ocular lens, what is the total magnification of the specimen? All right, so this is 400x. It's going to be multiplying the two together. That one's not too bad. Okay. Which objective lens do we use for oil immersion? All right, so um, oil immersion, this is going to be your 100x, and every time that you use the 100x, you should be using oil. So be aware of why you should be using the oil. That is to reduce light scatter, right? Improves image quality. 
Okay. Uh, right. So calculating the magnification, you guys got that multiplying, right? Understand the operation of the microscope and know all the parts. I will have a question on the test, but I will have labeled a microscope part and you will have to um, not only identify what the part is, but what it does. Okay. Um, so know all the parts, the difficult ones that people tend to approach would be things like the nose piece. A lot of people don't know that a nose piece is the thing that rotates your objective lenses. Okay. So that one, the stage, maybe they don't know what's called a stage. I don't know. The condenser, those ones can be a little bit difficult. I don't know. Um, so know how to, what they are and how to use them. Understand why we use oil immersion. We just said that's going to be reducing light scatter. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Next. Okay, which antibiotic for Kirby Bauer, which an antibiotic has been least, is bacteria least susceptible to? Or susceptible or sensitive? Okay, so that's E. We saw in E there was no zone of inhibition, right? There was no clearing around it. So that bacteria was not phased at all by that antibiotic. So it was not susceptible to it. It was completely resistant. Okay, so remember what a zone of inhibition is, that clearing around the dip, right? Remember, you're going to measure it completely across the whole way. It's not going to be just a radius, right? It's going to be the whole diameter. Um, MIC is minimum inhibitory concentration. As you get further away from the disc, the concentration of that antibiotic decreases. So at the very edge of your zone of inhibition, that's where uh, the lowest concentration is that will affect that bacterium. Okay, so that would be used. There's math to figure it out, but that's what that means. Okay, uh, Mueller, Henson, Auger, the Auger that we used for this. Um, we made sure that all of our plates had the same depth as well as all the plates were the same depth all the way around. We also had pH control. That way the uh, antibiotics could spread uh, evenly throughout the plates, be reproducible between the plates, and not be affected by any pH differences. So, um, And then we have bacteriocidal versus bacteriostatic. You guys know this, probably heard it a million times. By now you know that bacteriocidal means that we're killing the bacteria, and bacteriostatic that we are um, just inhibiting the growth. Also be aware that if I ask you a question about if you were to swab inside that zone of inhibition, that clear area, and streak it onto a plate and it grew, that would mean that that antibiotic was bacteriostatic, right? Okay, so as long as you guys keep up with that, you should be in good shape, at least for that part of it. Um, that's it. So if you guys have any questions about any of the material for the lab, um, don't hesitate to contact me, or of course, welcome to ask now if you want. Um, and happy studying. Please remember to take breaks while you guys are studying. Um, and let's see the podium. I know you guys like that part. <laughs> All right, good job, guys. You're free to go.